to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. It is so lovely to have you here today. I am super excited for you to hear from today's guest, Nina Teichels. I met her, you guys, recently at a conference. I've known about her for a very long time, but she is an investigative science journalist and a leader in nutrition reporting. And she is challenging the conventional wisdom on dietary fat, particularly whether saturated fat causes heart disease and whether fat really makes us fat. The New York Times bestselling author, she wrote a book called The Big Fat Surprise. She serves as the executive director of the Nutrition Coalition. And this is a independent nonprofit group that promotes evidence-based nutrition policy. She is one of a new generation of researchers that are arguing that diets lower in carbohydrates are a scientifically sound approach for reversing nutrition-related diseases. So you, of course, know Nina is one of my amazing allies in the low-carb space. Nina, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Dr. Jamie, it's great to be here. Thank you. And I just have to make one correction, which is I'm no longer the executive director of the Nutrition Coalition. I am the founder and I can, I'm can i still on the board, but I'm but okay. the new executive director, but we can talk about that later. Well, we'll give you all the credit that you deserve uh, because you. You, are, you are a mover and a shaker. And I'm very interested to know, how did you ever get into shaking up the nutrition world? Well, the Nutrition Coalition, you mean? Why did I found yeah. that? Well, um, I had just come out of writing my book, and that took me almost a decade of research and reading thousands and thousands of scientific studies and learning really the entire history of nutrition research going back to the 20s and 30s and even before. And then we, I, I, I didn't, wasn't so aware that we have this nutrition policy that the government, the government dictates our nutrition, you know, in schools and hospitals and, uh, you know, all your doctors, dietitians, nurses, everybody's just delivering to you this government policy on nutrition. It comes out every five years. It's supposedly updated. So it was coming out the year after my book was published. And I read the scientific report, which was almost 500 pages of the expert group reviewing the science. And I realized there's no science in like, where's all the science that I had been studying for so long? Where are all the studies? Where are, you know, all these studies that show that a low fat diet doesn't work and that restricting saturated fat did not lower rates of heart disease. And none of the science was in these guidelines. And in fact, it was really one of the worst scientific documents that I had ever read. And naively I thought, well, these folks in Washington, they just don't know about the science. We just have to march up there and show them that they have somehow neglected to look at all of this science that, you know, in many cases, the government itself has funded through the National Institutes of Health. So that was this extraordinarily naive <laughs> idea on my part. But um, I will say, you know, it's been, it's been seven years now. And we have, I mean, I think this group has first of all, it's the only group in the world really working on trying to change nutrition policy to reflect the science. And we have really single-handedly elevated this whole issue to be, you know, to created global awareness, had articles in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. We, I've been quoted in almost all of the, you know, the mainstream media on this topic. And we have actually generated you know, reports from the National Academy of Sciences on the problems of lack of scientific rigor in the guidelines. We, I mean, we can talk more about what's going on right now. There's calls for greater transparency by you know, members of Congress. So we have kind of single-handedly brought this issue to the fore. And, and I still think, although it is like trying to shift the course of the Titanic, I mean, it is not something that happens overnight. I still think it's incredibly important for all Americans, um, you know, whether your kid is in school or you have a aging relative in a nursing home, or you just go to your doctor and you know they say you can't follow that low carb diet because the guidelines say that that's not good for your health or that's not an you know that's not sort of the standard approved uh, yeah. dietary protocol. So I mean, we all encounter this in one form or another. Right. Um, so it's unavoidable. Yeah. I think that that's true. So, I mean, that remains, uh, I think, a real, an extremely important issue. And I try to keep that going along with my journalism, which yeah. I think is also important. So these U.S. dietary guidelines come out every five years, correct? And they basically dictate 
what is recommended in schools, in hospitals, in nursing homes. So there's kind of this trickle down effect when these U.S. dietary guidelines come out. And there obviously is a lot of controversy associated with that. Can you kind of expand for us, what role do scientists play in the food industry? So you have people, right, doing basic science research, but what are the tie together for us, basic scientists and in the food industry and yeah. how a lot of this controversy exists? Okay, so that is a story I think that had really never been told until my book, which was astonishing for me to discover the degree to which really the food industry, not just the food industry, but the pharmaceutical industry uh, influences nutrition science, right? You might be thinking of why the pharmaceutical industry? Well, I mean, it's, it seems very cynical to say this, but it is true that the pharmaceutical industry uh, profits from illness, from sickness, from especially from chronic disease when you're taking pills or injections or whatever it is over the course of, of decades of your, of your life. So, and the food industry, it's obvious there are companies that they want to sell you their um, highly packaged processed foods and, and they have an interest in creating guidelines and, and science to reflect that. Well, one of the things that I was able to discover in the course of my research for my book, and I think that's really the first time that that whole story has been told about how the food industry, not only the food industry, but the pharmaceutical industry influences nutrition science. So I was able to stitch together that story going back really to at least 1941, which was when the then growing early processed food companies like the Standard Biscuit, Biscuit Company and Heinz and a bunch of other companies got together to create something called the Nutrition Foundation, which was designed to fund nutrition science at its very source, right? Go in, find the scientists, influence their research at the very starting point of doing research. So they would discover certain things and maybe not discover other things. Like for instance, a very early example was when a researcher warned of the dangers of trans fats, which are now banned from the US food supply. Right. The food industry stepped in and funded a piece of research that contradicted that, right? And so, so you know, it was funded by the margarine industry. And so that's one of the tactics that they would use. Like if a study came out threatening one of their prized ingredients mm -hmm. or something about grains, they would fund a study to the contrary. So the scientific record was always muddled and, un and confused, and you could never say something definitively. Of course, that still happens today, right? Right. My book also documents how the American Heart Association was funded by Procter and Gamble, maker of Crisco oil, and um, which sort of that company sort of launched the American Heart Association to be a national powerhouse. And then not too long thereafter, they're recommending vegetable oils to replace uh, saturated fats in the food supply. Procter and Gamble, maker of Crisco oil, and I think still a big funder today of the American Heart Association. So. What I discovered is that at every point of the progression of science to nutrition science, all the way up to policy, the food industry is involved, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just the research, they fund the labs, then they fund the conferences, which is kind of where the oxygen exists to right. discuss ideas. If there's no conference, there's no real, there's no real conversation around. So there were never any conferences really around seed oils. Why? Because nobody would fund them. Who's going to fund right. that? Um, and then they fund the medical journals that publish the scientific articles where, you know, that's how an academic makes their career. And then, and then you get to Washington and what uh, you discover is that, you know, of course the lobbyists from these giant multi, uh, ultra processed food companies and the pharmaceutical industry, which, you know, to be clear, they make their money from people taking pills or on devices or on injections. They do not make their money from healthy people who are not on medication. Right. So we, you know, that sounds horribly cynical, but it's just nevertheless true. Those companies, all of them are hyper-focused on U.S. nutrition policy, right? Because it affects everything. There's, there are billions, I think there's like $800 billion in contracts going out to school lunches and all the nutrition feeding assistance programs. Wow. If you are one of the companies delivering your pastry or your orange juice to kids in schools, you have, you know, that is like an incredible home run for you as a company. Right. Um, 
not to mention maybe your products get some kind of stamp of approval in the grocery store for adhering to the guidelines. So what we discovered, we did a paper, um, which was the first ever systematic review of the expert scientific committee that's supposed to review the science on the guidelines, mm -hmm. called the Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee, appointed every five years. We found that 95% of them had a conflict of interest with a food or pharmaceutical company. Wow. And over 50% of that committee had 30 such ties or more. There was one person on the committee who had 152 ties to food and pharma. Wow. And it's astonishing. That's And now the, the Dietary Guideline Committee, the new one that's been appointed, won't release their conflicts of interest by name. They've kind of made this anonymized document where they all release them together, which is a meaningless document. So now... Um, you know, sen we actually have Senator Chuck Grassley. I was going to say, there's some recent revelations that have happened. So yeah, tell us, give us the update. Week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just last week, um, so this is late May. The Senator Chuck Grassley, who's long been somebody interested in conflict of interest issues, he called on the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is in charge of our guidelines, and said, "You have to give proper disclosures." conflict of interest disclosures for all the members on your expert committee. You can't just put them all together in a document where you can't match the name to the right. to the company right. because the whole point of disclosure is to see what company might be influencing which person. Uh, and I don't, I honestly, I don't think that would have happened without our, you know, analysis that came out with that 95% number I just mentioned. Yeah. And our group also was able to um, really educate members of Congress such that now we have four National Academy of Sciences reports saying guidelines, you know, lack scientific rigor, are not transparent enough, do not serve the general public because there's no advice for people with diet related diseases. I mean, we got, we, we have been able to obtain sort of the, the documentation that allows uh, politicians to act, yeah. um, which is, phenomenal that we're now sort of seeing the benefits of that. And maybe we'll slowly see this, um, we'll slowly see some change start to happen. Yeah. So yeah, our hope is that there's more transparency, but still at the end of the day, these actual guidelines are, are crap. I mean, when I look at the school lunches that my kids are eating, they're so deficient in protein, there's no iron, there's no vitamin D, there's no choline, they're only folate is folic acid, right? Which is put into the cereals and things like that. So are people actually following the current U.S. dietary guidelines, or is it that they're just doing whatever they want and they're not even following it? Um, so that's a really good question. And because, and it's the whole idea that Americans just don't follow the guidelines has been used to try to argue well, the guidelines don't matter. Why are you paying so much attention to them? Nobody follows them anyway. We're all, you know, we're all just screwing up here as Americans, not doing a good job of following. But I mean, just to give you an example of your kid in school, your kid is following the guidelines, right? Those school lunches are in large part have to follow the guidelines. But one of the things that I found was that the best available government data on this on both food availability and consumption is that Americans have to an astonishing degree followed the guidelines, right? And you have to remember that actually starting, you know, the, it was the American Heart Association who first gave this low fat, cut back on saturated fats, you know, eat more grains advice, right? So we've been doing this since 1961, which was when the American Heart Association launched this whole I, low fat idea. Since 1970, Americans eat like, I'm not going to get these numbers probably exact, but this is U.S. government data, like like 25 percent more grains, um, 20 something or 30 something percent more fruits and vegetables. We eat much more of what we've been told to eat. Right. We we and at the same time. Oh, sorry. I should add one more to that. Eighty nine percent more vegetable oil. Right. I mean, vegetable oils have just gone from almost zero in the early 1900s and to no you know, butter, now, like, less red meat, less eggs. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Red meat, um, specifically beef is down 35%. Red meat in general, 28%. Whole milk down 79%. Animal fats down by 29%. Um, eggs are down. Butter is down. I mean, everything that we were told to eat, less of we eat less of, and every, dramatically. And everything we're told to eat more of, we eat much more of. And overall, our carbohydrate consumption went from being about... Um, 
uh, it's uh, about 40% of calories to now being about 55% of calories. So I mean, we've dramatically increased our carbohydrate consumption while as a percentage of total calories. Yeah. And then, so we really have followed the guidelines. We've done an amazing job. And at the very same time, you know, in what direction have we seen all chronic yeah. diseases in clinical medicine, more obesity, more cancer, more heart disease, more diabetes, more dementia and cognitive decline. I mean, it's just doubled, tripled. It's not slowing down. It's a huge problem. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease yeah. in children now, you know, epidemic. I mean, it really is just a terrible, a terrible story. And so the idea that we should do more of what we've been doing is like saying, oh, we have this jumbo jet that consistently crashes and kills everybody on board, let's order some more of those. Like rather than ground the jets and say, what's going on? Let's just take a critical look. That there, you know, nearly all of our nutrition experts and our public health officials just have no critical view that we might be doing something wrong. They're just for, let's do more of the same. Yeah. With this, I don't think it was somebody, at, Somebody's, it's been attributed to Albert Einstein, but I'm not sure if it's true. But, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. Right, right. Well, let's pick apart some of the science because I think that there are people that are still so confused about saturated fat and salt and all these different things. There was a recent study that came out looking at low carb versus the DASH diet, which a lot of what they have pushed has been very plant based, Mediterranean based, DASH diet, um, which of course is high in fruits and vegetables and low in sodium. I mean, it's high in carbohydrates and low in nutrient dense animal foods. So let's settle the science on salt. What, what does the literature really say about salt in the diet? So just to understand, like there really hasn't been a randomized controlled clinical trial on salt. So we don't have the most rigorous kind of evidence on salt that we would need to, to, to definitively settle this question. But if you look at the observational data that show associations um, a weaker form of data, but still the vast majority of, of, of studies show that a, that, that there's a kind of sweet spot for salt. That is where most Americans are. You know, if you, if it's too high, you do increase, uh, there's a tendency to increase cardiovascular events, right. Or, you know, heart disease, hypertension, but if you go too low, and certainly if you go as low as is currently recommended, you see a, a corresponding increase in cardiovascular events. So there's actual harm being done if you excessively lower salt. And let me just say one other thing, which is that now there's due to, um, you know, the Healthy School Act that was passed in 2010 10 under Michelle Obama, they're lowering the salt in school lunches. There's absolutely zero data on children and salt. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that, uh, we should be giving children low salt meals is just based in nothing at all. Yeah. Um, but the only data that shows a benefit from reducing salt are populations who are middle-aged populations. Most of this has been done on men only. So middle-aged men mostly who have hypertension, high blood pressure and are given a salt reduced diet can see their blood pressure lower by a bit. Right. I, I, I can't remember the exact number. And I think it's just your systolic, um, the systolic number. But what you're referring to, this trial that came out showing, comparing the, it's called DASH, right? Famous diet, always one of the top diets by U.S. News and World Report ranked. It was developed by the National Institutes of Health. So it's our government's approach. Dietary alternatives to stop hypertension is what DASH stands for. And it's a diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lower in salt. So that diet was compared in a clinical trial to a ketogenic diet. And on blood pressure, which DASH was designed exclusively to do to take care of, the keto diet did twice as well. Yep. Keto dieters who weren't restricting salt did twice as well. They also, although not told to restrict calories, lost twice as much weight. And they also did much better at reducing, um, it's called a hemoglobin A1C, but you know, your average blood sugar, everything level, got better, showing uh, everything got better, much better on keto. Yeah. That's the first time that there's been a head to head study looking at keto and dash. And it's an extraordinary study. I think, you know, 
it's it's amazing to see those go those two diets go head to head. There was another diet, another trial where they had the DASH dieters and compared them to higher fat DASH dieters, so just the same DASH diet, but with more fat and the high fat diet did better yeah. on all, on all outcome markers. So, I mean, it's obvious fat restriction, salt restriction even is, is not effective, not the most effective strategy for lowering yeah. blood pressure. And I mean, for people listening, the reason that on low carbon ketogenic diets that you actually need more salt than especially what's recommended is because insulin is very good. It, one of its roles in the kidneys is to reabsorb sodium in the distal nephron of the kidney. So if you keep carbs low and you keep insulin low, you're not reabsorbing as much sodium. So you need to consume more sodium. So my patients and, and myself, I mean, we're consuming three, four, five, some of my very active, larger patients sweating, you know, outside in the heat could need upwards of seven or eight grams. I mean, that's, we're talking three to four times the level that's recommended, you know, with these current guidelines. Okay. So if you're restricting carbs, especially salt your foods, my kids carry those little mini shakers too. They salt, they love salt. Um, saturated fat. How much saturated wait, wait, before fat? Before we leave... Yeah, before Sorry, we just leave salt. before we leave salt, on, on one of the world experts on this subject, um, um, Salim Youssef, who's uh, uh, the head of cardiovascular unit at McMaster's University, he has done some of the most important studies on salt and sodium. And he says, he says, trust your taste buds on salt. Mm. He said, people will consume as much salt as they need. If you want something saltier, just salt it and don't even question it because humans are remarkably resistant to changing their salt intake because they you need salt. So you can just trust your instincts on that. So I just another okay. note for your listeners or viewers. Trust your body. Trust your body. Yeah. Okay. So saturated fat. Does saturated fat cause heart disease? Where where should this fall in our diet? So this was so my book, um, it's not to plug my book, but it really was the first, it was really the first um place where all the arguments about saturated fat were I brought together and made the sustained argument for how we had gotten it wrong on saturated fats and 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 why the evidence really never existed to show that they cause heart disease but what was the whole story you know starting from the proposal that saturated fat and cholesterol cause heart disease which was an idea that goes back to the 1950s and and so and it, it's important to understand that story just to so understand how that's become so deeply ingrained in our minds because it's been recommended by the American Heart Association since 1961, right? Before then, they were, it wasn't really considered bad to eat <laughs> to eat meat and whole fat cheese. So right. just well, we don't even we have no memory of that. So, but it was an idea that had was born in a moment of time, and then after that policy came out in 1961, there was this extraordinary effort to show that it was true, right? I mean, that's not the way policy is supposed to happen. You're supposed to test it first and then make it into policy, but it happened in reverse. There were randomized controlled clinical trials, the gold standard of science conducted by governments all over the world, really, US, England, Australia, Finland, and those trials on all together 76,000 people could not show that people who reduce saturated fat uh, or really cut it in half um, and replaced it with polyunsaturated vegetable oils, those people did not suffer fewer heart attacks They and zero effect on, on coronary mortality, which is death from heart disease or total mortality, right? You don't want to save people from dying of heart disease, but then they die of higher rates from cancer instead, which is in fact what they found in all these trials. Mm. People on the higher vegetable oil diets died at higher rates from cancer. So, um, but there was one of the fascinating things, and which is a whole story in and of itself, is like these trials came out, the results were published and people ignored them. They ignored them because the American Heart Association, the National Institutes of Health, and all these other public health organizations had kind of gotten on board with the idea that saturated fat was bad and cholesterol was bad, and they could not reverse out of that really nutritional a dogma. Something had become a dogma at that point. I mean, there's just billions of dollars invested in that being the truth. And that more or less is the story that is still with us today. So those clinical trials, which were long lost to science because of my book, Gary Taubes' books, 
those trials were rediscovered, right, by the scientific community. We brought them to light. And then what ensued since about 2010 is that teams of scientists all over the world looked at those clinical trials kind of afresh. Like, what did they say? We didn't even know they existed. And so now there are more, there are probably almost 25 systematic reviews, meta-analyses, independent teams of scientists looking at these trials and saying, you know what? We were wrong on saturated fats. The evidence doesn't support it. We should not have specific numeric limits on saturated fats. There's no reason to avoid them. They don't cause heart disease. And yet that enormous body of scientific literature has yet to kind of penetrate the policy making bodies and public health experts who are in charge. Um, they won't look at it. They won't listen to it. We could go in detail. I mean, we've had scientists visit Washington and talk to the top experts at the, who are writing the guidelines and they simply will not. They, they don't want to hear it. See it. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, what is in the guidelines is to limit saturated fat and to eat low fat diets. And I grew up in the eighties and nineties. I mean, I remember studying one time in college, I was eating hot tamales because it had like this American heart association, low fat stamp on it. And the same thing with cereals. Yes. I remember as a kid going to the cereal aisle and you know, the Cheerios had the American heart association stamp of approval on it for low fat diets. Do low fat diets prevent us from getting diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and cancer? Is there evidence that low fat diets help people? Um, so no, there's no evidence and there, and there never has been, and there's some evidence actually of harm. Um, and that is another like restricting. So we've been talking about swapping out saturated fat for polyunsaturated yeah. vegetable oils. Now we're talking about your total fat content. And that's also idea brought to us by the American Heart Association going back to about 1970. And the whole idea was fat is, is a, you know, one of three macronutrients, fat, protein, carbohydrates, fat is nine calories per gram. Whereas, um, carbohydrate is about four or five calories per gram. So let's fat is uniquely high, dense in calories. So let's reduce the fat to prevent obesity. That became policy became government policy. Again, no clinical trials. In fact, the clinical trials that existed, they were tiny and they had been inconclusive. So finally, the government funds one of the largest ever trials on nutrition called the Women's Health Initiative. Yep. Um, that was, it wasn't, you know, the government started recommending this diet, at a low-fat diet in 1980. They don't fund trials until the 1990s, yeah. right? So we're talking almost 20 years later. Those results come out in 2006. And almost 50,000 women are tested on a low-fat diet. And they significantly reduced fat and saturated fat in the intervention group where they basically just gave them a copy of the dietary guidelines and said, follow this. At the end of that study, no reduction in obesity. I mean, maybe two pounds. This is seven years later. The women on the low-fat diet are two pounds lighter, no reduction in diabetes, no effect on heart disease, no effect on any form of cancer that they looked at. And it was actually powered for cancer because it went on so long. So really no effect of the low fat diet. And there's been now many, many clinical trials in the low fat diet. And what do they find? They find that they, they can reduce your LDL cholesterol, which is your so-called bad, L, you know, your bad cholesterol, but they also consistently reduce your good cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So they bring they actually, at best, have a mixed effect, right, on your heart disease risk. But they probably are, they they probably are bad for health, right? Because they also increase your triglycerides, which are the fatty acids circulating in your blood, which is a direct measure of the amount of carbohydrates you're eating. Yeah. So now you have your HDL falling, your triglycerides going up, both pretty reliable signs that your heart disease risk is increasing. And there was a large government trial that showed the people, the women on the low fat diet actually ended up having higher rates of insulin resistance. So due to all that, the government actually stopped the, if you go to the government dietary guidelines website or the American Heart Association and search low fat, it's gone. The terms low fat are gone, although they've sort of been tiptoed out, right? I don't, there hasn't been any major public health. There wasn't a huge announcement. People. No, <laughs> right? There was just like, you can eat avocado toast now. Yeah, there, was, there wasn't a, a big announcement for that. 
But I think it's an important thing to highlight is when you take something out of the diet, it's going to get replaced with something. And so when you vilify foods that have fat in them, like nutrient dense animal foods, people are going to eat. So they're going to replace that with something, whether it be, um, you know, if it's just fat for fat, vegetable oils, if it's low fat, then it's going to be carbohydrates and, and flours and sugars and things like that, that don't have fat in them. And unfortunately those foods don't have a lot of nutrients. So even though you're equating calories, I mean, I, part of my story, I just counted, cal- I have a degree in nutrition. Um, and a medical degree. And I, in medical school would just count goldfish crackers. They were low fat. I was just counting my calories, just making sure calories in calories out. I ended up with prediabetes and hypothyroidism. So, um, talk to us about, um, what evidence there is for low carb diets. I mean, why should the U S dietary guidelines, this council that, I mean, why should they open up their minds to low carb diets? I saw somebody recently, I don't even know if you saw this, Nina, but somebody blasted you this week after this Chuck Grassley thing came out saying, well, Nina is in Nina advocates for low carb diet. So she just, she has this just much, as just as much conflict of interest in this whole thing as these other people. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. you know, she's not getting paid by, you know, uh, people that make keto treats, like, come on, give me a break. Um, so, right. so kind of so, tell us, yeah. tell us why they need to listen to the, to the literature on low carb diets and what science. that could do yeah. for Americans. I should tell your listeners or viewers, like I don't receive any industry money at all. Right. And, and by the way, I'm also not writing the guidelines. So like if I were in that position of power, you know, that would be, um, highly relevant, but it's important to know, I just come with no industry backing of any kind. Um, so, and never have for any of my work, the low carb diet is, um, has been, is now the most studied diet in all of nutrition. There are, there are at least nine or 10 two year experiments on low carb where they have actually followed the diet long enough to see if there are any negative side effects. And there are, there are none. Um, and, and it has been studied now in, um, in, in, like, if you, if you go to the government's website where you can search scientific studies, if you look just for low carb clinical trials, again, the most rigorous kind of science, you will get 1500 hits. So those are all different papers. Some of them may be on the same trial. That's as much as you get if you search the Mediterranean diet. So maybe it's as, 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 as well researched as Mediterranean diet, but, um, it is, it's like, there is an astonishing number of trials. There's at least, well, I would say 150 trials on low carb diet now. And, and what's astonishing is that that science has been actually, you know, so assiduously ignored by say this, these expert committees who are looking at the science for the guidelines we actually did some freedom of information act requests and found that they had looked at the low carb diet. They had done a review of it. They found um, dozens of studies and then they decided not to publish it along with the rest of the science that they were reviewing. And one Harvard expert pipes up and says, "Um, you know, I don't think we should be burying the science on low carb because it's so, (laughs) it's so effective. It's clearly so effective. Um, And, but, but we only found that by, you know, filing these, these Freedom of Information Act requests. And then in the last go around for the guidelines, they set the inclusion exclusion criteria such that they could find zero trials on low carb, which is absurd. You know, in 2020, anybody who's connected with science at all knows where that, are there you are, looking? that there's <laughs> you know, like, where is your head in the sand on that? Because one of the committee members, the expert committee members herself had led a clinical trial on low carb, but they couldn't find that one. Mm. So um, there's a tremendous amount of science on, on low carb. Um, and I think that, and the low carb and ketogenic diets. And what you find is that again, long-term experiments, no evidence of harm. The benefits are, um, are really in almost every case of head to head trials with other diets, the, the low carb or ketogenic diet outperforms in on almost every measure in terms of cardiovascular risk disease, um, the effect on diabetes, only the low carb ketogenic diet can reverse type two diabetes. No other diet can do that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and weight loss, I think the results are a little bit more equivocal. It's like, I mean, I think what we people see anecdotally in the community is is much more success in losing weight than has been able, they've been documented in clinical trials. But but in every head-to-head -head trial of a, of low carb versus low fat, people lose more weight yep. on a low carbohydrate diet. Yep. And they're still people who just are so stuck with, it's, it's just about the calories. I was, when you were speaking at Low Carb Denver, um, I was listening to some people's conversation and they said, well, you know, with the ketogenic diet, if they just, you know, if they've got more satiety and they're just taking in less calories, then that's where all the benefits come from. But I think, you know, the literature is really showing that ketones work as a cellular signaling molecule. There's so many advantages. Anecdotally, I've seen incredible things with my patients. I mean, people who have attempted to lose weight using a multitude of diets, weight watchers, low fat diet, uh, you know, the old versions of Atkins diets. And I just think that um, it is an incredible tool. Now, one thing when you spoke at Low Carb Denver, Nina, you were talking about how these U.S. dietary guidelines are meant uh, for prevention and not treatment. So there could be somebody listening that's saying, well, yeah, therapeutic ketosis is used as a treatment for type 2 diabetes for somebody with epilepsy. Are low carb diets good for prevention? Because that's really what the U.S. dietary guidelines are meant for. Is that correct? Am I saying that correctly? You, uh, yes, they are. Um, so, which is interesting because just as an interesting point, they are, you know, they're applied to all Americans, right? And they're served to captive populations in nursing homes and schools. And but actually they're only targeted to the, the seven to 40% of Americans who are not di adults who are not diagnosed with a chronic diet related disease. Yeah, right. So I feel like there's really less, not there's not many <laughs> to everybody. Right. I mean, the last number was that 93% of Americans have been diagnosed with some kind of diet related disease or on medication for, and, and, and so that tells you the dietary guidelines are not for the general public, even though they're applied to the general public. And that's a problem. Low carb has been found to, um, uh, it has been tested in, in populations that are pre diet who have pre diabetes. So not formally with any disease and they, um, and they show improvements. They also have, uh, in mice experiments, they show improvements in longevity. Um, the, those mice, uh, on low carb ketogenic diets live longer. Um, and I mean, I just think in general and that, that, if you, you know, people are always, people report that they're able to maintain their weight. Like I'm not, I have no disease state right now, but I will tell you that if I, and this is true for so many people that they, I will gain weight. <laughs> I will gain weight. I will, you know, that, that people are finding that they, they usually start, usually you start a diet because you have a problem, right? And then when you reverse your problem, you realize that, well, then you need to stay on it in order to prevent, right. um, coming that back from coming back. And I would say, uh, so I would say that, but there have been some clinical trials on basically healthy people showing or, or people on the kind of on the edge of disease showing that a low carb diet keeps them healthier, Yeah, prevents disease. So yes, prevention is, I think, um, part of what, and I mean, uh, part of what it was not necessary for everybody. I mean, I would never be anybody to say like, it is not necessary for, for the general population at all. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, growing children, maybe not, maybe you, you know, maybe, maybe they're, they have different insulin responses. Um, but I, I would say that it's not unhealthy for anybody yeah. to, to follow it. it. And it definitely has all kinds of ancillary benefits. I mean, people find their acne clears up, yep. people find their mood is elevated. They feel better. They, they have more energy there. I mean, now we're finding it reduces depression. It can reverse bipolar disorder. So there's just all these other applications that it seems as if, you know, as, as Dr. Ken Berry might say, it's, you know, it's just our, the natural human diet. This is, yeah. this is the yeah, way we proper human diet. It. I mean, in my mind, it yeah. would make sense that if something treats diabetes, reverses diabetes, that that same diet could prevent diabetes from happening. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting to try to tease those two things apart and say, well, this, these diets are just for treatment and these diets are just for prevention. I feel like that would be the same thing. You know, if it prevents yeah. the disease, it probably treats the disease too. Um, well, that is true, but I will make just one like counterpoint there, which is that people who are metabolically healthy 
do have like, more they flexibility, have a different metab. They're more flexible. They're flexible. Yeah. It's when you've tipped over into unhealth yeah. that really your choices are limited. Yeah. And like for my followers, they know I used to have prediabetes. I mean, I was in ketosis for a, a few years. My diet has really evolved. I'm a lot more just low carb now. You know, I eat berries. I might have some, you know, um, gluten-free bread even, or something, you know, occasionally, but I have I'm so metabolically healthy now that I have so much more leeway and flexibility. I'm in the, I'm in the 7%, Nina, we're going to call it the 7% club from now on. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Proud to be there. Okay. So there's somebody listening that you've convinced them that low carb diets are good, that they don't need to limit salt and fat, but they are still, they have heard the controversy with red meat and that, you know, maybe we've dispelled the the myths on, on heart disease, but that it causes cancer, you know, which is another thing, colon cancer, red meat, you got to limit it. Right. What, what, what does the evidence really say there? So that's something I took a really a deep dive and investigated because when the World Health, the, the WHO, the WHO recommendations came out on meat, red meat and cancer, um, you know, it's scary to, to read those headlines. I mean, there, there were a, just a tremendous number of problems with that review. Um, I mean, I looked at the committee that reviewed it and I think, I, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but let's say like about 80% of that committee had members they had spent their entire life publishing against red meat so there was just it was it it was enormous bias on this committee and then in the end they looked at a, just a tiny handful of study they ignored a lot of the evidence presented to them i talked to people who were there at the meeting and they said they you know trying to prevent present the evidence showing that nitrates were not bad for health and they were literally shouted down where they were not allowed to present their data. The animal data was all ignored. So they looked at only the very weakest form of data, which is shows associations, right? A correlation, not causation, the weakest form of data. And I mean, just in a nutshell, why is that especially weak on red meat? Because because red meat eaters tend to smoke more, drink more, get less exercise. I mean, Red meat eaters have been the people who ignore all their doctor's orders who've been telling them not to eat red meat for the last couple decades, right? So they are less healthy people generally. Do we know if it's the red meat or if it was the fries and the milkshake and the bun that went along with that hamburger order, you know, that McDonald's order? So we can't, that science cannot distinguish between all those various, um, those various factors. You can't blame red meat for what the French fries did. So, but taking that very weak data, they combined it all and they found an effect, the tiniest possible effect. So, uh, you know, just to talk numbers here for a second, the effect, there was something called a relative risk of 1.17. Okay. A relative risk of one means no increased risk. And this was 1.17. Just to put that into context, when they said cigarettes cause cancer, the effect was 15 to 30 times greater risk of lung cancer for uh, heavy smokers versus never smokers. Now we're talking, instead of 15 to 30, we're talking 1.17. It is a tiny number. And in general, scientists do not consider that number worth paying any attention to because there's so many of these other factors, as we're mentioning, the milkshakes, the French fries. You can't, you cannot pin that on red meat. But there has been a, a long time campaign against red meat for a lot of different reasons. Some of them bizarrely have to do with a religious group that wants, you know, very influential in nutrition science that wants to get rid of, you know, believes the vegan diet is the way to connect with God. Um, The Seventh-day Adventists, but it's just been a long time bias in the field. And when there was the most rigorous ever reviews, um, according to a methodology called GRADE, which is used by 150 public health organizations around the world, when they took grade and they applied it to all the data on red meat by unbiased researchers in Canada, they came out with a bunch of studies that showed that basically said weak evidence, not much evidence, no effect on heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer. We can find no effect or we can find only a tiny amount of evidence that shows very little effect of red meat on any disease. And just so you get a sense of the politics of this, when those studies came out, 
there was a there was an advocacy group that tried to get them retracted before they were even published. Wow. And they and the editor in chief of the journal in which they were going they were being published, the Annals of Internal Medicine, a very prestigious journal. She said she got more emails on that. She said it was more vitriolic than the hate mail she got from the American Rifle Association. <laughs> like that is how insane the vegan activists are. Yeah. Um, so the politics around this are just are dominant. Yeah. It's really not about science. Um, and so, you know, why eat red meat? Like why, why should you eat red meat? Well, it's the most nutrient dense food, really. I mean, other than organ meats, yeah. red meat is incredibly nutrient dense. When they feed it to school children, they show improvements in cognitive skills more than any other food they supplement. Uh, it shows improvements in in um, just well being. I mean, it's been very little studied, but all the studies show that that it's it's really does improve at least in children. It just improves everything about their well being. Um, it's a incredibly nutritious food. It's also like a far more efficient way to get a complete protein. You can have a hundred calories of beef, or you can have eight hundred calories of peanut butter, right. along with a massive amount of carbs. And so it's the most efficient way to get your complete protein, which we all need. I love that. Especially my, as, especially as we age. Yeah. My, <laughs> my kids eat a lot of red meat. That's for sure. Um, so your book, Nina, the big fat surprise, it's been considered a must read by some prestigious medical journals, um, the Lancet, the BMJ, the American journal of clinical nutrition, but mainstream medicine, my colleagues, other doctors, um, are still telling people don't eat saturated fat, eat a plant-based diet. So we're still missing this connection. Tell people how, who are listening, maybe there's a doctor or nurse listening. Maybe there's just a regular person listening. Where can they find good unbiased information? If they want to dig into this themselves, how can they help your cause and what you're doing at the nutrition coalition and what's happening with the next set of us dietary guidelines? Okay, well, they, taking those questions in turn, how to find unbiased information. Unfortunately, you're not going to get it in your medical journals and you're not going to get it in the mainstream press because because of pharmaceutical funding largely and, and long time existing bias. So um, I, don't, I, 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 I struggle to name one magazine <laughs> or newspaper or, or medical um, scientific journal where I think there's really unbiased information coming out, yeah. which is a very sad thing to say. So, um, so that's difficult. I mean, it's, we have to establish our own alternative, uh, institutions. There's something called the society for metabolic health practitioners, a group that had, they have some pretty good, um, data that's or stud, scientific studies that have been, um, curated on their website, the nutrition coalition at nutritioncoalition.us has a lot on the policy and quite a bit on the science. We list all the doc the information on red meat, saturated fats, salt. I mean, we have, we have a lot of studies listed there on both sides of the issue. We show it comprehensively. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously many books that I, I think are excellent. And I mean, I think Gary Taubes is an excellent uh, journalist and he's, he and I are maybe the, I, I mean, I don't know, I would like to name other nutrition journalists yeah. that I, that I know are out there, but I, I can't at the moment really think of other people. Um, it's, it's a, that it's just a field that where there's really, it's, it's, it has been bleached of its, <laughs> of its more objective journalists and reporting. Um, and I think that's largely due to the kind of influence that industry has had on it. Yeah. Um, so where will the dietary guidelines go? I, you know, it's exciting to me that there is, there's an active consideration right now to create an alternative guidelines that are for people with diet related diseases, recognizing finally this point that the nutrition coalition has been making for many years now, which is to really emphasize the fact that those guidelines are not for the general public, mm -hmm. right? The general public is sick. Those guidelines at 55% of carbohydrates and six servings of grains a day, including three servings of refined grains are, is not for people who are sick. Yeah. So we think there's an opportunity opening to have an alternative set of guidelines. And we just will have to work really hard to make sure those include 
low carb ketogenic diets. Yeah. Um, but the door's opening for that to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So Pete, there's, there's some action on, 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 in Congress and on Capitol Hill. And so I, you know, people want to support that or learn more about that, sign up for our newsletter, the Nutrition Coalition, and please donate because we are not supported by industry and we are supported exclusively by um, by members of the public like like you out yeah. there listening and watching. So please, please support. I mean, I say it all the time. People have to become their own expert. You've got to pull the wool off your eyes. You know, pharma obviously has its own invested interests. The food industry, they want you to buy cereal and ho-hos and all the things, but you would feel like our government would stand up for us and want us to be healthy, you guys, but they've been infiltrated. I mean, and this is food is just one issue, right? Our dietary guidelines are one issue. There's lots of issues within our government, but um, please, Nina, we appreciate you so much and what you're doing. So if you guys are interested, go to her website, donate to the cause, get her book, The Big Fat Surprise, follow her work because, you know, she's really trying to, to, peel back the paint here of uh, what's <laughs> happened over the last hundred years. It's just been, uh, it's been a whirlwind. And I, and I hope that people listen, I'm starting to see a little bit of traction within the medical community. I'm starting to see other doctors asking me about low carbon ketogenic diets. The patients are coming to me. I saw so-and-so's YouTube channel. I saw Dr. Sivas, you know, Gary Tobbs, Eric Westman, you know, I could just start naming all these people that are doing such an amazing job of just letting their patients tell the stories. And you just, you can't deny it when, when people feel good and, and they're healthy, you know, that's right. I always, people on the internet want to defend what they're doing. I'm like, Hey, if you're healthy and you feel good, do whatever you want. But if you're right. not, you know, there's lots of options. So. Right. Right. I mean, your own good health. It's, it's just the best argument. You can't argue with the patient who's coming. I mean, all doctors do try, but you can't, it's hard to argue with somebody who comes into your office and has lost 50 pounds. What do yeah. you say? Oh, that's and dangerous. their blood pressure is normal and their right. A1C is 5.0. <laughs> right. And now you're going to oh. tell them their, their diet's going to kill them. Dangerous <laughs> diet you're on. <laughs> yeah. It's so you can't deny it. Yeah. But it really does take a village to create change and we need to create, we need to create broader change. I mean, beyond, you know, fixing your own health, fix the health of your family, your loved ones. And then it, we, as a community, as a society need to, need to change policies so that, you know, kids in schools, our military is not too fat to fight, you know, our yeah. people in nursing, we just have to come together as a community, I think, to make this happen. I love it. Well, thank you guys for listening and please share this podcast with all your family and friends. We always rely on you to help share these messages. Have a great day. Did you guys love that last episode of the Fit and Fabulous podcast? Well, of course you did. And I want to keep bringing you the most amazing content from the most incredible people. And you can help me by subscribing to the Dr. Fit and Fabulous channel. You guys know where the button is. Just click it. It's the doctor's orders.